I'm just going to jump right in. I want to tell you that I can help you learn how to have landscapes that you don't have to water really ever if that's your goal. That's not most people's goal. Most people's is less. But uh, if you will you know, be willing to think about new ideas and uh, learn how to really evaluate your soil and your situation, I can help you out. And we're going to look at the plants that I know will work for you in those situations. If they don't, I will tell you so. Okay. First, just to make sure that you know when you're researching plants or if you're going to a nursery and you look at a plant tag and you're looking for the plant zone, you want to make sure you're buying plants that are hardy in our area. You are in zone 8A. Sometimes it's just going to say zone 8. Uh, so don't let A and B throw you that much. But uh, it, it, oops, if you see something that's uh, a higher number from that, it's not going to be a hardy plant for you. And that's something that you would have to bring in for the winter and overwinter in your garage or uh, in the house. Hey, I want to teach you how to buy a live plant. You can go to any nursery anywhere and buy dead plants. And then you come home and you plant them and you think you don't have a green thumb when the truth is you bought a dead plant. So let's look at on the uh, left hand side of the screen. You'll notice that I'm sorry, I dropped my mouse, so I've got to figure out what I'm doing now. Um, okay. I think I just have to go for it down here. Hang on. <laughs> of course, it went under a piece of furniture. <laughs> it's nowhere to be seen. Sadly, I can't use my pointer, I don't think, without my mouse. But the slide, the plant on the left hand side, you'll notice the root system is white. If you had really good eyes, you can look at the tips of those roots and you'll see little fuzzy hairs that are actually called root hairs. The root hairs are the only plant of the part of the root system that has the ability to take water and nutrients into the plant. So those are very important. And uh, really, if, if you're really dedicated at low water, you can buy a plant that's only has a few live roots and get it going again. But it's someone that's not going to feel super sorry for that plant. Now the plant over on your right side, you can see how brown it is. If you tugged on those roots, they would likely crumble in your hands. Um, they would, you'll notice here, if you look in the center of the screen, you can see where part of the root has slipped away the inside of the root is exposed and the outside part of the root has slipped away there's nothing in the world that could cause that except for excessive water that's what root rot is the rotten roots um, most plants that are overwatered to a degree like that you're never going to get them back again so but nurseries are selling those plants there's usually not a whole lot in every nursery but um, it's just your luck you got it. Okay. Every now and then I might mention deadheading, and all that means is that you're removing the seed head of the flower before it has a chance for the, you know, the old flower dies and then develops into a seed head. You want to remove that before it has a chance to make the seed because uh, sometimes you'll do that for cosmetic reasons. Sometimes you do it for uh, seedling control. Uh, if you don't ever let the seed mature, then you don't have to worry about controlling those seedlings the following year. Uh, I will warn you about that kind of stuff as we go along. Now, if you're not real used to using perennial plants, 
Most perennials do not totally disappear during the winter. Some do. Um, and the ones that do are really good plants that you could interplant with spring bulbs. So like a lantana will die way, way back in the wintertime. And you can have daffodils on the back side of that and maybe wild grape hyacinths on the front side of it. So you'd have something short and purple and something tall, yellow or white in the background. Now, this is an example of one. This is a Texas bluebell. As you can see, the top part of the plant has died back with the first hard freeze, and the leaves are present for next year's plant at the base of the plant. See that on the left side, on the right side, you see where I've trimmed it back. I usually leave a little bit of stubble there, so if it gets covered up with leaves, it's easier for me to find it when uh, I uncover it in the spring. Learn to identify different seedlings. Uh, there's a lot of these plants that will put out seed, and if you're on a budget, uh, it'll be very helpful for you to be able to uh, get seedlings out of your own yard. A gallon size plant of most of these plants is going to cost you at least nine to eleven dollars, depending on where you shop. Little seedlings like this, this is a blackfoot daisy. You can go around in the spring and pop these out of the ground with a tablespoon and move them to their new spot, water them in, and basically you're done. You don't have to do much to them after that. Some reason, the ones that come from seedlings are much hardier plants than the ones that you buy at a nursery. Oops, all right. Let's go ahead and get started now. I gave you a little bit. This is aster, we call it fall aster, but there are many fall asters because that's when most bloom. This is aster oblongifolia, it's native to Texas. This will be about two feet tall and I allow at least four feet of space per plant. So uh, you'll get a circle template if you're working on your own sketch. Uh, no, I don't have time to go into all that. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have gone down that road. Okay. If you look over to the right, you'll see there's its winter foliage there at the base. So I'm going to cut off all of that dead stuff that's sticking out and leave that winter foliage. This is also a good time if I want some somewhere else, I probably will go in with the shovel and cut off some of that and move it during the winter as well. We can plant year round here, and uh, if you have the plants, go for it. Our ground doesn't freeze, and they're going to be out there in the uh, weather anyway. This plant can go in sun or uh, bright shade. Purple bleeding heart is the purple foliage plant we're looking at in front. It does bloom, but we really do grow it for its foliage, not its flower. Uh, this is kind of a spreading plant, so it's something that you want to make sure you want before you uh, put it there. Um, and it's also something that if you're walking in your neighborhood and you see some of this out on a parkway like this, bend down and break off a piece, and take it home and stick it in the ground and water it and it will grow. Uh, very easy to get it started. So it is, um, I, I would say generally if I was going to plant more than one, I would probably space these two and a half feet at least uh, and let them grow together. Now keep in mind, I like to plant or plan for plants to be their mature size. So I don't like to waste money by crowding things together at first because I don't know what their size is. So make sure you learn the sizes of plants. Uh, maybe do internet searches and look for the, the biggest number that you see is the one that you want to go by. This too will grow in sun to part shade. Okay, Asclepius. Is butterfly weed or milkweeds. And milkweeds are very important plants for monarch uh, migrations because this is the host plant that they lay their eggs on. 
So that means that your butterfly weed will probably get chewed up at some point. And that's something sustainability you have to keep in mind. Sometimes part of your yard's going to be eaten because you're providing uh, food for butterfly larvae and things like that. One on the left hand side is a Mexican butterfly weed, or sometimes it's called tropical butterfly weed. This one will be about three feet tall and maybe three feet wide, and it has a really long blooming season. Uh, these, uh, these both need at least a half day sun to full sun. Now, the tropical one, sometimes we're, I think we're on the real border of what makes them uh, die back or survive the winter, and we don't want them to survive the winter. Uh, there's some concern about uh, some diseases in the butterflies if these don't die back. So go ahead and cut them off and after the first freeze, just like you would any of your other perennials or many of your other perennials. The one on the right is our native one to this area. I think it's really gorgeous. And there are many other milkweeds that are good for monarch butterflies, um, but they're difficult to find. And I have not had luck with that yet. They're not real easy to transplant as a general rule. So make sure you put it where you want it. Now, this type of plant has a, a tendency to get aphids. And there are certain plants that you'll have in your landscape that will be attracted to aphids. And you can see on the left, it's a small insect that attaches to the underside of the leaf and it can be really damaging to the plant if you don't get them under control. There's two ways to control this naturally. Uh, one is to take a really hard stream of water and support your leaf and uh, blow it as hard as you can. And basically, you're just knocking the aphids off. And that doesn't sound like you're accomplishing much, but you are because it knocks them, it separates them from their mouth parts. So they're going to die without a mouth. Organic gardening is still pretty rough, <laughs> so it's not for the weak hearted. Uh, pay attention, see if you have some ladybugs, and I would recommend going online and learning all the different life phases of ladybugs so that you know how to recognize them. And that is 95% uh, of their diet is aphids, and once they show up, they will handle the problem. So uh, keep that in mind. We've got two ways to do that for us. Also, another really beneficial insect are lace wings. And you may notice sometimes, notice the picture on the right there, those little tiny eggs on those little, little pieces of string almost, it looks like. Uh, you'll find these hanging on your chain link fences or on this. This is actually on a plant. And if you see stuff like that, that's a good sign you've got lace wings and they're, uh, they too will eat a lot of uh, insects, including aphids. You want to also just be aware of the different uh, caterpillars that you might encounter and try to identify them. Some are going to be really great ones that you want, like these swallowtail larvae that you see on the left. And then on the right, we see a, a gypsy sphinx spot uh, larvae, and that's not a great insect to have. So that one I'm going to pick off and get rid of him. Uh, whereas the other one I'm going to, one year I ended up going to the store and buying a whole bunch of parsley for my <laughs> swallowtail larvae because they were eating me out of house and home. But once you start getting into that, you'll do the same thing. All right, here's Texas bluebells. It's a uh, warm season blooming native perennial. This was the one that I showed you at the beginning where it had leaves at the base during the winter. So 
this one you're going to cut off to the base or right above where those leaves are. Uh, and that's basically all you'll do to this. Sometimes I will deadhead mine just for cosmetic reasons because you can see those are pretty large flowers and when they all start dying off, it's not so attractive. These really do need some sun and uh, they really do need low water. Uh, I have seen these blooming out in cow pastures in the end of July in the North Texas area. So you can see how extremely drought tolerant they are. This one's a non-native, one of the non-natives I'm showing you, but it's such a tough little plant. It's called Candy Tuft, and it is a spring blooming evergreen perennial. Overall, the height is about four to five inches, the foliage height, and then the flowers will be maybe six inches. Blooms early in the spring and will bloom for about six or eight weeks. Very bright white flowers, even on a uh, low moonlight night, you can see these flowers out in the yard and the beans on them, they're really bright. I allow four feet of space for one of these and uh, they can go in sun or part shade. What on the upper screen, it really is in solid shade almost. So uh, maybe they could go from sun to shade. Neglected to tell you on the slide before the bluebells. Those are going to be about 24 inches tall by 30 inches wide. Okay, this is Blackfoot Daisy, the small white daisy is what we're looking at here. This is native to my area where I live and it's just a superstar plant. It's a semi evergreen plant and all you really need to do to this is wait till the end of winter. Uh, if there's some dieback, you can go out with hedge clippers and lightly trim off what's died back. Uh, but mostly you could just leave it alone and it, the new growth would overcome what has died back and you would not see it anymore. This is about 12 inches tall in the center and it mounds down to about four inches on the edges. Um, I planted one of these last year. I live on a very rocky, shallow soil. I did water it last year and that's my rule is I'll water stuff the first year and then if it doesn't make it, it wasn't meant to be here. Uh, so that's how I treated this this year. You know, we had some really hot days towards the end of summer, never a drop of water. This is already almost four feet wide in a one year period. So it's a real performer. I've seen it bloom 12 months out of the year, but typically it blooms eight to nine months out of the year. So you can't get much better than that. However, it needs to be in full sun. Uh, it just cannot be in a place where there's a lot of leaf fall because it's hard to get leaves out of it and you will end up breaking it off. But all of that plant grows from one stem. This is another little superstar, also native to my area. This is a four nerve daisy. The foliage is evergreen. The foliage is maybe four inches tall. With the flowers, it's eight to 10 inches tall. This sometimes I'll deadhead, as you can see, it's blooming all at once. So that means all at once, those are going to be dead flowers. But if I don't have time, I don't. It's just a cosmetic reason to do it. Uh, but this too should bloom eight to nine months out of the year. Sometimes I've seen it blooming in January. Very uh, tough little native plants. These are the kind of plants that you can treat the way I treat them. Hey, this is a really large plant. Really, this almost, I guess, should be a shrub, but 
we do sell it with perennial plants. Uh, this is an Esperanza. The one on the left is the one that you're probably most familiar with. It's um, a yellow flower, and I would say it's going to be about six feet tall by five to six feet wide. And then the same thing on the one on the uh, right is called uh, Bells of Fire Esperanza. And it's a dark coral color. And I think it's probably going to be about the same size. I've only ever grown it in the pot, so I, I can't say that for sure. But you can see in a pot, it's four to five feet tall. So, so uh, and these will bloom in a, in a half a day sun to full sun, and maybe the yellow one might even do it in three hours of sun. This is another great plant to have in your uh, for monarch butterflies or butterflies in general. But you know we're on the migration path for monarch butterflies. That's why it seems like I'm harping about that. Uh, but this is called frostweed, and this is a very uh, nectar-rich plant blooming right at the time that the migration is happening. And basically, they'll stop on this plant all the way down into Mexico. Out here, I, I live in Boston County, south of Dallas, and um, you'll see acres of this out here. It's so cool. You would not believe the butterflies that are out here. So in a garden setting, this will probably get to be about five feet tall or maybe a little bit more. It will bloom pretty well in shade, and I thought it was a shade requiring plant, but I see it growing in pastures out here, so I think it could take quite a bit of sun. I did, uh, the first year I did have to water this sun. This year it looked pretty sad. I didn't water it, but it did go through a sad period. But you can see on the leaves uh, that, uh, well, actually you can't see that because this is a plant that, I was looking at this year. So this one does pretty much die back to the ground and I cut it off. And when, when I have plants that die back that harshly, I don't want to lose track of where they are. So when I cut them back, I cut, I'll leave maybe eight to 10 inches of stubble. So there's a little marker there that keeps me from trampling them as they're trying to come up in the spring. Okay, this is a plant, if you want butterflies, this would be a great plant for you to figure out where you might put it. And the reason I say this is it's an extremely aggressive plant. I have only willingly used it in a couple of landscape designs. And that was areas where I could surround its planting with concrete. So if you have a sidewalk that's adjacent to your building, like side of your house or something and you, that's made a little landlocked bed there, that would be a good place for something like this um, because it's going to overwhelm almost anything that it's planted with. Um, if you want to mix it though, make sure you mix it with things that's going to be taller than it is. So it will be about 24 to 30 inches tall. It's a very light lavender flower that does not photograph all that well, but I've never seen the butterflies that come to this plant anywhere else. You'll see butterflies that are a half an inch long uh, to just all these different butterflies you've never seen before. So if that's your thing, you need to find a spot for this. And it's really icky to cut back. It's kind of sticky leaves that will kind of stick to your blue jeans and stuff. So. I would minimize how much I use of it. Okay, almost nothing is as tough as lantana. Um, uh, lantana does die back pretty harshly. Uh, and if it doesn't, if we have a mild winter, I would still say cut it back harshly. One of those perennials that is just going to get wider and wider and wider if you let it go. Um, so there's all different sizes. This one on the left is called confetti. 
There's another one called Dallas red. It's a real dark red orange. Um, and those are both going to be shrub types, maybe four feet tall by six feet wide, something like that. And then the one on the uh, right is a trailing lantana that come in many different colors. And uh, they're usually about two feet tall and four to six feet wide. You don't need a whole bunch of them when they get four to six feet wide. It's real important to draw it to scale. And we'll talk later about my book, how you can get that, and it explains how to draw the design to scale. Okay, salvia grega is a great plant. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. Uh, it's a mostly evergreen. Uh, flowering woody perennial comes in many different colors as you can see we have red on the left coral down on the bottom right and then white on the upper right there's also different lavenders and purples um, a really great plant hummingbirds really love it and the thing about this plant is that it really does thrive on Little bit of pruning now and then. So, in my designs, I'll tell customers that this should be lightly pruned in mid July or so, and uh, again about the end of January. When you're doing that, not only are you shaping it a little bit, but every time you prune on a plant, you release hormones that tell the plant to grow. So, that's what keeps these nice and bushy and thick in the center. You can, in fact, you can see the one on the left, it's a little bushier than this one on the bottom right. The one on the bottom right, they're not doing that pruning and it's starting to get kind of open and sprawling. I checked to see if that was you calling me, Jordan. <laughs> okay. Uh, these can go in Let's say two to three hours of sun to full sun. This is a indigo spire salvia. I really love this plant. Now this one, I have to confess, it would appreciate a little supplemental water during the summer. So if you have a spot where it's a, a bed is receiving that, this would really thrive there. Now when I say a little supplemental water, I'm talking about two to three times a summer, not every two to three days, anything like that. So indigo spires, that's a four foot chain link fence. So you can see the foliage part, it's gonna be about four feet tall. And then there's about 18 inch purple flower spikes, blue flower spikes, great cut flower. And uh, hummingbirds are always going to like salvias, just about any kind or color they're going to go to. This is a salvia though that does die pretty much to the ground. You will have some winter leaves at the base, but after that first hard freeze, go ahead and go out and cut it back. Okay, this one's called Mexican bush sage, kind of a raspberry colored flower. I have not had tremendous luck with this, but it's so pretty that I think I have to show it to you, but I suspect maybe it would appreciate some supplemental water. And I would think that it's going to be about um, probably three feet tall, three to four feet tall with the flower and probably four feet wide. So it's basically four feet. Bonnie, what is the, the cactus like plant behind it? That looks like a Spanish dagger to me, but I'm not a, it's a yucca, but I'm not sure which yucca it is. But that's a lot what it looks like. And Spanish dagger is one of those yuccas that would come tree form and it'll be a multi-trunk tree. Uh, and that's my guess. Best I can do on that. Okay, here's a salvia that will actually grow in the shade. Uh, it's a little red flower that you see there and it's called cedar sage. 
and look at how unusual the leaf is. Almost looks like a geranium type leaf. So if you have a really shady spot that you're wanting some color, you can have color in the shade. Uh, you just have to know what plants to use. So that's a good one. And that's going to be, it's it's almost a ground cover type plant. So maybe space it 32 inches. And uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's mostly evergreen. I like that. All right, here's one of my other superstars. I uh, can't really well. This is shrubby skull cat, and uh, this is a uh, mostly evergreen perennial. Sometimes, though, they're not evergreen, and I don't know what makes them evergreen and what doesn't. I suspect it's water, though, um, because this bed here is has never been watered and maybe the people who have them die back are watering, I guess. So this will, this is entirely in the shade, this particular planting. So you can see that's pretty good color and shade. This plant with maturity, if you don't ever control its size at all, will get over five feet wide and in this bed, this was a test bed that I used to have in Dallas, and I think that's one plant that has gone that far wide, and it's probably six feet by eight feet. There might have been two there, but it, I think it was one. And it was almost like a, a blooming ground cover in the shade for me. I just loved it that way. So if you have a really shady spot that you could let go into ground cover and you wanted some flower i really believe this is a good one to look at very drought tolerant but it will also when it's out in full sun you almost can't see the leaves because of the flowers so it will be much heavier in the sun allow a minimum of four to five space feet per plant it's going to be about eight inches tall by four to five feet wide. It takes a while for it to get there and you can keep it smaller if you want to. It would be really beautiful hanging over a retaining wall or a flower pot, something like that too. Shrimp plants are excellent plants that um, can be a little bit hard to find, but you can find them. The one on the, let's look at the one in the center and on the right first. It's called red shrimp plant. It's the most common and it's totally hardy here. Uh, it's a semi evergreen, though I usually do cut mine back by springtime. It just seems like it comes back prettier when it's been cut back. Now, the one on the left is a variety that a friend gave me that I didn't know what it was and I finally after growing it in a pot for three years, uh, I called the nursery she got it from to ask what it was. And she said, she told me it was the fruit cocktail shrimp plant. And she said, but it's not hardy. And I said, oh, but it is. I told her I'd been growing it in a pot for three years without taking it in. And so, voila, it's a perennial. And they're both, the uh, hummingbirds just love shrimp plant. Sun or shade. On these plants, it doesn't matter. And then we have Turk's cat, is a really great perennial for us. It also will bloom just as well in sun or shade. The difference is it will be taller in the sun and shorter in the shade. So in the sun, it'll probably be three and a half, four feet tall. And in the shade, it'll be more like two to two and a half feet tall. In both cases, it will be seven feet wide plus. And if you have one that you had been growing for five years and it's still a tiny plant, you don't know how to water. You, you're keeping your plant from developing a root system that will make it grow. This plant never got a drop of water. In fact, in this yard, this is my old house in Dallas. 
you can see that St. Augustine grass there, actually where the grass is on the front side of this picture, never got water and the yard side would get between zero and six irrigations per year, St. Augustine. And you can see it's nice looking St. Augustine. So, uh, But let me get off that and just mention that, of course, hummingbirds like these, and it comes in red or pink. I found the hummingbirds weren't wild about the pink ones. I don't know why. And I think this will be our last one here. This is Zexminia. Uh, native to Texas, I'm not sure where, but this is one tough plant. Uh, in years that we had record breaking droughts or record breaking days over 100 degrees, without one drop of irrigation, this plant never stopped blooming. And that's a good plant, I feel. We need more of them. This will be about with the flowers, it'll be about 30 inches tall, allow at least four feet of space for it. It does die all the way to the ground, and all of this top growth is really supported by just maybe 10 to 15 main stems down at the base of the plant. So after the first freeze, what I would do with this plant is I'll go out with a long pair of lockers and just get down into the center of the plant and cut those long things off. And then you just lift that whole thing up and do with the, whatever you're going to do with it. Um, that's the easiest way to get it uh, cut back. Otherwise, it, it's really a, a mess. <laughs> just trust me on that. Okay, I think that's a uh, all we have time for, I think. So, what do you think, Jordan? Are you there? We had some questions come in. This is Andy. Um, uh, one of the questions was wondering about growing perennials in containers. If you could expand on that a little bit. Yes, uh, I will grow anything in a container to see if it will work, and they most often do. So Blackfoot Daisy was excellent in a container. Uh, shrubby Skullcap would be great. I think a lot, I think most of them would be, maybe Lantana would be your most challenging one uh, because not only are they kind of big and wild, they kind of have stickery leaves that they might kind of grab hold of you when you walk by. Uh, Maybe the, the milkweed wouldn't be a great one, but I think most of what I showed you, <laughs> most of what I showed you uh, would work pretty well. Probably the smaller, the better on them. And this question might be more for Georgian, but uh, talking about the monarch butterflies and the migration patterns you mentioned with all the construction going on here in Dallas, their habitat is being destroyed by the minute. Um, maybe a future session could be about specifically creating a garden just for them, or is there anything you wanted to elaborate about butterfly gardens or, or supporting the migration to make their make this easier for them? I, I love that idea for a topic, and we will definitely add that on our list. And I am not a butterfly expert, so if anybody else on our panel is, jump in, please. I think as long as you have flowering things during their migration, they're going to be happy. And especially have things like that frost weed and that um, mist flower, if you have a spot for that. I don't think that would work in a pot, really. But here I see the monarchs going to everything, and, and the uh, I have a lot of swallowtails. You know, when I lived in the city, I thought butterflies were city creatures, but they are country creatures. I've never seen so many butterflies. And uh, so it's really interesting to see the different plants. They all go to salvias. They all go to uh, squash flowers. They go to tomato flowers. So uh, 
that's what I'm saying is almost anything that blooms is going to attract them and feed them. And if you don't have a lot blooming, I don't know, may, I wonder if there's some type of a um, butterfly feeder like there would be for bees during the heat of the summer when bees need a little bit of supplement, they'll make sugar water, sponges type things for them. So I don't know if there's something like that that would be available. That's something I'll check into. <laughs> Yeah, Jasmine liked that idea. You know, I, I would say, I, I'm, I'm just going to put this out here because I, I always feel guilty, but one year I got all excited and I said, I'm going to create uh, plant flowers that are butterfly and bee friendly. And I did, and twice that year I had to pay a lot of money to have bees extracted from my roof line. And so, I guess I'm just wondering, is there a way we can be good to the bees, but keep them out of our house? That's a risk you're going to take. Uh, I, I, I have a friend that has the same problem. I would say the thing to do is to make sure that you've closed up those access points. Mm -hmm. so someplace they were getting in, you know, mm -hmm. that a big hole to go in there. Yeah. Um, I wonder, well, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Let me go back to butterfly feeding. If you are someone who has, um, you eat a lot of cantaloupe or watermelon, always save those rinds, scoop, scoop it out, and then set them out there in the garden because they like to come to those rinds. And uh, it's kind of disgusting. You'll eventually have to go out there and deal with them. but that they'll last for quite a while, and that would be some a good way to feed them during migration, I think. That's good. Um, I, I don't know if we have any more questions, but I did see that you have a whole section on native grasses, which is one of my favorites. And so, um, Andy, Lori, can you tell us if we have any other questions, or can Bonnie do her section on native grasses? <laughs> Other questions here. Other questions. Go ahead. Um, we did have a comment that um, that it's hard to find milkweed these days. Is there a source for that that's really good? Is it a problem? Uh, it's a problem for me too. You just have to. Uh, you might even have to order like the native one, the Asclepias tuberosa. Uh, get it online, perhaps, and, and try that. But I have not been able to find it for a long time. But if you are going to find it, it's going to be at a nursery like Redenta's or um, Blue Moon Gardens out in Edom, Texas, some place that really does specialize in native plants. But always call around and ask because when I started out in this business, perennials were non-existent. Chrysanthemums was about it. And I just started encouraging people, ask your nurserymen for these perennials, because by asking, we create the demand. And they'll start asking growers, and growers will start getting it. We need to be growing these. I think the Mexican one or the tropical one must be a lot easier to get growing, but, um, and that's why they produce them so much more, but let's ask for those native ones. You also, might, if you go to Austin, there's a lot of nurseries down there that really do specialize in native plants. So do a little search when you, if you're going down that way, who you might go to. That's, that's sorry, that's the best I can do for you. What was that last comment? I didn't. A concern about mosquitoes. No, I didn't have anything about mosquitoes. Oh. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so should I go on to the grasses real quick or? Yes, please do. All right, this is. <sighs> You think you have trouble finding milkweed. 
you're going to have trouble finding a lot of these too, but same type nurseries are where you're going to find these or get them online. Or come to beautiful Bosque County and stop on the side of the road. <laughs> All right, this is Little Blue Stem. As you see the picture on the left, very vertical, upright type growing grass. That's why I love it so much. And blue, gray, blue color until fall and winter. And then you can see it turns a really pretty rusty brown color. It's just one of my very favorite grasses. And this will range, it depends on your depth of soil and how much water you give it, two to four feet. And I would say this would be all of these grasses and the lines are things that once you get them going, they should not be watered. So, uh, because if, if you do, they might get overwhelmingly large and lop over, and that's not a great rule. Okay, this one is the only shade loving grass that I'm aware of that's an ornamental grass. Uh, it's called inland sea oats. This can be a little bit of a invasive type grass because you see the seed heads over here and every one of those little things is a seed and it puts out a lot of it so what i used to do with mine was about the time it starts looking pretty i would appreciate its prettiness for a couple of weeks and then i'd put on my leather gloves and go out and uh, just pull the seeds off and do whatever i was going to do with them uh, just so I didn't have to deal with the seedlings. So in essence, I'm deadheading it. Um, space these about um, oh, maybe 30 inches wide. I think they're really cool looking little plants. They look like they're uh, little dwarf bamboo or something. On the uh, little blue stem, I would space it, if you're putting it into your garden, space it rather erratically because you wouldn't see it in nature perfectly spaced. But it's going to get probably uh, two feet wide. So that'll give you an idea of um, you know, four feet apart at least. Maybe six or eight even would be better. This is giant liriope, not a native grass, obviously. It's related to liriope, the ground cover, but it is a bunching grass. It's not a spreading grass. It's about three by three in size and it will go in sun or shade, and it's evergreen. Grasses in general, you should cut back by the end of January, because that's when we start getting some warm enough days that it's going to start waking up. So even this one, I would cut back so that you don't have any leaves with dead tips the following year. Mexican feather grass. This one can be very invasive. Uh, I have never grown it because of that. I don't have time to take control of seedlings and this will come up all around your landscape. But now that I've made it sound so attractive, it is the one that has so much air movement to it and will toss back and forth. And it has, you can see on the one, the far left there, that little whitish tip, that's the flower of it. That's the seed bed. And um, they're about, oh, two and a half feet tall by, I always would space them three to four feet wide. This is probably my favorite native grass, maybe a little blue stem in this. Lindheimer's mealy grass. It is uh, with the flowers, that's the white part that you see, is uh, probably six feet tall. The foliage part is about four feet tall, blooms in the fall. These are out blooming right now, really gorgeous. I allow seven to eight feet for one of these, and it's quite easy to cut back, whereas a lot of these larger grasses are harder to cut back. This one's pink mealy grass, and uh, you'll see these are blooming right now too. That's what it's called, this pink mealy. Space these probably five feet apart. It just depends on how, how much you want them touching each other. And uh, there's also a dwarf 
Lindheimer's Lily that's this size with white flowers. This is Earthwind Switchgrass. Switchgrasses can be a little bit rangy looking. I like this one because it's pretty vertical and pretty well behaved. It's going to be about five feet tall. And again, the flowers are always happening uh, in the fall on the grasses. All right, well, we got through that just fine. Thank you, Bonnie. That was fantastic. Um, Lori or Andy, did we have any more questions come in? I had one question come in uh, and says, I would like to know if purple bleeding heart hold water in the center. I'm concerned about mosquito larva growing in the center on the stem. All right. Uh, I think that if you are a person who's watering frequently, that could be a concern. However, that could be a concern on any plant. We harbor mosquitoes in our landscapes by irrigation, and especially in ground cover areas and things like that. Your ground covers, if they're established, pretty much don't need irrigation. Maybe just once a month, deeply, July, August, and September, and then let them be dry the rest of the time. So. Let your plants dry out some, and I think that'll help you out there. And, and I have a question about the uh, inland sea oats. How long does it take them to get established? Because I, I've had some for about three years now, and they're still kind of puny looking. Are you watering? Mm, my husband may be, yeah. That might be your problem. Okay. All right, thank you. If they're not, a, if someone tells me that a plant hasn't grown in three years, that's always the first thing I want to know. It's either there's not enough water or there's too much water. And if you're watering, it's going to be too much water. Okay. That's always a frustration to me, especially with indoor potted plants, that the signs of overwater and underwater very often look the same. I know. <laughs> always check before you water so uh, you know what i i forgot that i did not have an ending um, picture with my company information so can i give that out yes please do so to learn more about my company i still work in the dallas area even though i don't live up there anymore beautifullandscapes.net and you can learn you can see my services and fees on that website and also how to purchase a book there. And it has my phone number, which I'll go ahead and give that is 972-224-1179. Appreciate y'all being with us today. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. We appreciate you being with us and we look forward to you being with us again next 